Is everyone ready? Okay. <clears throat> he died on the gates. Contention 1 is Section 8 housing. Harvard University in 2018 explains that Section 8 is a means-tested welfare program that allows private landlords to rent apartments and homes to qualified low-income tenants. Voucher holders pay 30% of their income while the program covers the rest. Indeed, Fisher C15 of the CVPP concludes that Section 8 reduced the share of families that lacked a home of their own by 80% and lifted 2.8 million people, including 900,000 children, above the poverty line. Without Section 8, the National Low-Income Housing Coalition in 2018 finds that officials would have to make $45,000 a year to cheap, pay for the cheapest alternative. However, replacing Section 8 with a UBI would fail to provide the financial coverage necessary for housing, as Matthews 19 of Vox confirms that getting rid of all American welfare programs would only cover an annual UBI of over 30, uh, with less than $13,000 for every citizen. Crucially, the CDC in 2019 estimates that homelessness is associated with an increased mortality rate that is nine times higher than those not homeless. Cont contention 2 is foreign aid. When American welfare is cut, public backlash ensues because Americans feel as if their international issues are prioritized over their own. Consequently, foreign aid would be first on the chopping block as it already radius in 2017 indicates that 60% of Americans would agree with cutting aid. Foreign aid is critical in providing life-saving assistance as worth of the global citizen finds that the U.S. provides food aid for over 3 billion people or 40% of the world's population in more than 150 countries around the, around the globe. Cutting aid now cuts off the lifeline for the developing world. Germany in 2017 reports that U.S. food Today prevents 30 million people from starving. Contention three is the economic crisis. Replacing means tested welfare programs with a universal basic income has two economic implications. The sub first subpoint is recession recovery. An American recession looms just over the horizon. As March 19th, the Washington Post reports that after looking at various factors in the economy, 75% of economists believe that there will be a recession from the next year. Due to America's vast economic linkages with the rest of the world, a U.S. recession would see no borders. Consequently, the International Monetary Fund in 2013 indicates that the next global recession would push 900 million people into poverty. Fortunately, the existing means Tested welfare program serves as an automatic stabilizer that bolsters aggregate demand and stimulates economic recovery in times during times of downturn. That's why Rubin 17 of the Washington Post explains that during recession, more people qualify for welfare, providing wealth to the poor and allowing them to spend in the economy. United States economic recovery spills over globally. As Aurora 04 of the IMF furthers that a 1% increase in growth in the United States economy would lead to a 0.8% increase in the growth of America's trading partners. However, ending the means tested welfare system would worsen the impending recession by removing automatic stabilizers. Rice 12 of the Columbia University confirms that the U.S. current welfare programs at just 0.6% economic volatility would increase by 7%, thus increasing the likelihood and severity of recession. In times of need, these stabilizers are critical to prevent further disasters. Map was 19 of the Center of American Progress concludes that automatic stabilizers have prevented an additional 18% decline in GDP during the 2008 recession. So point B is a debt disaster. Paulson of the U Penn Warren finds that financing a universal basic income would increase the debt by 81% by 2032. Critically, a rising debt is inevitably followed by higher interest rates. Laubach 12 of the Federal Reserve finds that empirically that a 1% increase in debt to GDP ratio will increase the long term interest rates by four basis points. Keeping American interest rates low is important for the rest of the world, as Colombo 16 and Forbes reports that the low U.S. interest rates allow trillions of dollars in foreign investments to flow into emergency mar emerging markets in developing countries. Unfortunately, Baswani 18 of the BBC News that Higher interest rates lure investors away from emerging markets back to America because of greater returns devastating Argentina, Turkey, and many other emerging markets. Thus, Stalker 70 of the World Bank quantifies that for every 1% increase in U.S. bond yields reduces capital flows to emerging markets by 45%. For this reason, COPEC 16 of the Institute of International Finance concludes that rising interest rates in America increases economic crises in emerging markets by 88%, problematically. Clifton 15 of the GDC concludes that the <clears throat> third world debt crisis, which is caused by rising U.S. interest rates, led to two decades of lost development and 125 million people pushed into poverty. For these reasons, he died on the gates.
Nueva affirms our first contention is repairing the broken welfare system. Incessant welfare is failing the status quo. Despite implementing 79 incessant welfare programs since the 60s and spending nearly $1 trillion a year on said programs for the poor, President 18 finds that the poverty rate has largely hovered at 10% over the past 50 years. More specifically, current incessant welfare programs are failing in two ways. First, by disincentivizing work. Unfortunately, most incessant welfare programs struggle from a poverty cliff where individuals to the poverty line are disincentivized from working so as to keep their welfare benefits. Indeed, 10 of 13 of the K-2 finds that the welfare pays more than a minimum wage job in 35 states. Simply put, workers are turning away from more prosperous employment as they see that upgrading their job could sacrifice their welfare and leave them completely vulnerable. A UBI would eliminate that perverse incentive allowing families to escape the trap of poverty and climb the socioeconomic ladder. These effects are historically proven in Schneider 17 that the USA Today explains that families take off welfare due to work requirements saw their income double in one year and triple in four years. Second, by wasting valuable funds. Welfare puts a dangerous amount of power and funding into the hands of an overly bureaucratic welfare system which results in billions of lost dollars of funding for America's poorest. Indeed, Flower 16 of 538 finds that the current system of welfare gives total power to individual states to decide how and where to spend their money. While this may seem efficient in theory, the reality is that almost every state is overlapping or contradictory eligibility rules and restrictions, making the current welfare system a nightmare of un unaccountability. In this unclear system, dollars are squandered. As Valis 15 of the Center for American Progress finds that in TANF, one of the largest means of welfare programs, only 25% of funds go towards helping those in need. Fortunately, a UBI would effectively put money directly in the hands of those who need it. Columbino, 19th at the University of Turin, quantifies that because a UBI is as simple as giving a check, the administrative cost of a UBI would be five times smaller than the incessant welfare. Overall, the impact of these flaws in our welfare system is millions of poverty. Gen 19 of the Washington Post quantifies that 25% of people living in poverty who are eligible for benefits fail to receive them. Our second contention is rekindling economic growth. A UBI would have a tremendous positive impact on growth as it puts hard cash in the hands of those who would use spend it and stimulate the entire economy. Matthews 17 of Vox warns that the economy generally tends to slow down and struggle when the middle and lower class aren't earning enough to spend it and stimulate businesses to produce goods and services. Fortunately, a UBI would give individuals money to spend productively, bolstering the economy. Matthews continues, as the poor and middle class begin to receive their UBI, $2.5 trillion of consumer spending would enter the economy in eight years by 2025 and would overall increase, uh, overall create 4.7 million jobs. The overall result of implementing a UBI would be massive American growth. As Zesa 17, the Result Institute quantifies that an annual UBI of $1,000 would increase economic growth by a staggering 12.56% over the next eight years. The impact of economic growth is insulating against recessions. The U.S. is hurling towards a recession right now for their own evidence and ours. Murray 18 of Bloomberg News finds the probability of the U.S. entering a recession by 2021 is higher than 80%. Fortunately, a UBI could act as a key source of stimulus during and before the next recession. Schiller 17 at Fast Company contextualizes that a UBI would act as a permanent economic stimulus as it would trigger $2 trillion in additional spending that feeds down to businesses and individuals. As the entire economy responds to increased spending and consumer demand, recessions will become far more manageable and might not happen in the short term. There are two warrants. A, investor Confidence. In error 19, the Hindu business line finds that putting money directly in the hands of the lower and middle class through a UBI uniquely increases private investor confidence, which means they invest before a recession happens, but also invest while the recession is ongoing. Second, on shock prevention, 1819 finds that high levels of economic growth insulate the economy from any shocks, preventing short periods of downturn from snowballing, snowballing into full recessions. Overall, the IMF evidence, per their own evidence, explains that the next American recession would likely go global and push 900 million people into poverty. Thus, the way about firms. Let's talk about disincentivizing work. So what particular like programs disincentivize work? Uh, the ITC, SNAP, TANF, like program. Okay, why does SNAP? SNAP disincentivizes work because it has a pretty like clear cutoff as Wait, to when you stop getting off on SNAP. As, you, as to I when you just, people they, move, yeah, move on sure. pathway. As to when you lose the majority of your benefits. Yeah. Even though SCAP is scalar to 135% of the federal poverty line, I mean, once you hit like 122%, you lose like over half your benefits, which is why 26% of people go into unemployment to provide food for their families. Can I have a question? All right. Um, let's talk about the second contention about foreign aid. Your radius evidence tells me that 60% of Americans want to cut foreign aid in the status quo. Yeah. Doesn't that mean foreign aid's gonna get, get cut in the long term? Argument. We would say that in insofar as- your radius evidence says. What? Your radius evidence says nothing about perception. It just says Americans wanna cut now. Yeah, so this is the perception argument that we make. We say that the perception that we're prioritizing international issues over domestic issues incentivizes Americans to uniquely cut the foreign aid. Have a okay, question? so then we'll follow up. You tell me that automatic stabilizers are really good in times of economic crisis. Yep. In that time of economic crisis, that means the US will cut foreign aid insofar as it's unpopular and people are saying that you're prioritizing- Sorry. 
Wait, you guys say the perception is having these status quo. In so far as we have these automatic state wise. You just tell me. You just tell me. You don't. The American people don't want governments to prioritize foreign spending over domestic spending, specifically yeah, but, in times of economic yeah, crisis. Sure. Why does that calculus only change in our world? Automatic state wise, used for the UBI. I mean, used for the welfare actually prevents or lessens the risk of recession. That's that my question. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about your contention too about spending. Right? Is consumer spending high right now? <laughs> No, we have brown wow. evidence that says we still have two trillion dollars worth of economic output that can. Wait, no. My question is: Is consumer spending high right now? Yeah, I said relatively not high. It's like medium. How? I just Why? explained. There are two trillion dollars room worth of room right now in the status quo in one year of consumer spending to completely maximize America's economy. Okay, sure. Uh, let's talk about say, like your tire third contention. Yeah, okay. Do all of these effect? Do all these recovery mechanisms go into effect after recession happens or before recession happens? Sorry. No, our second. Okay, you, you just you say you say two things. Okay, you read evidence from Rubin. You read evidence about state lizers, You read okay. evidence about debt disasters. Two things. Our first talk about after is recession. talking about automatic stabilizers. That's during a recession. Okay, but second, so during a recession. What? During a recession. Yeah, during a recession. Sure. Three. Crystal, to be clear, the third contention is about what happens during a recession. No, just our first sub point. Okay, so which? What are your other two sub points critical to? Debt. Can I have a question? Does the debt affect the U.S. You recovery? Have a bunch no, of I, questions. this is you didn't answer my first question. I said debt. I said okay. is debt during the, does debt matter during a recession or before a recession? Before a recession. Can I have a question? Sure. Okay. Let's talk about your argument. Is your argument that you prevent a recession? Yes. We prevent yes. the next. We, we prevent the recession that we both agree is going to happen in the short term. Okay. We both agree this so is going to happen in the next three years. We might not prevent for like a recession that happens in ten years. Okay. Sure. Um, we have ten seconds. Yeah. Back to debt. Okay. Your evidence says debt only matters because you can't pass larger stimulus packages. That happens during a recession, right? What? The debt argument is about what happens during a recession about government spending during a recession, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so it is about what happens during a recession. No. Wait. I wasn't listening to you, sorry. <laughs> Wait, uh, on your last two pieces of insolvency, just like what was the evidence name? Which was the final? Oh, Aaron and Aiken. Wait, how do you spell that? Aiken might not be there, but Aaron, just N. Why can't I can't see anything? N-R-A-Y-A-S. No, I'm just going to come over here. you got to show me. I don't, I don't know what it is. Start with their first contention about repairing a broken system. At the top, they read uniqueness about 10% constant poverty rate. However, Door 17 finds that consumption at the bottom is actually steadily, the consumption of poverty is actually stable at 3%. Meyer 17 indicates that this is the best way to actually accurately measure the reflection of current American state. Yes, he finds that welfare and liquid assets aren't actually accounted for in their poverty statistic, and that's why consumption of poverty actually proves that welfare is actually working in the status quo. It's only at 3%. Then, let's talk about the specific warrants. First of all, they talk about disincentivizing more. Two responses. First, the Dawson 18 finds that the majority of people are actually far, far 
far away from the bed of cliff. That means that the people at the bottom in America are actually uh, are actually in a life or death situation. That's why welfare is actually what props them up. There is no disincentive for the work for these people. Second of all, adults in 18 continues that states ultimately wean people off these benefits in the first place. It's a transition period in which it constantly gradually declines. So it's not a benefit cliff like my opponents talk about. Then onto the second argument about wasting funds. Two responses. First of all, even if it is an imperfect system, it still helps people. We would argue that an imperfect system that helps some is better than an insufficient system that helps none. That's why Campbell 17 and Box finds that 47 million people have been pulled out of poverty specifically because of means tested welfare. Second of all, it's ultimately just functions of mitigatory defense. Like, it's not even offense. Don't even evaluate it. Let's go to the second contention about uh, economic growth. Realize, two top level responses. First of all, consumer spending is actually incredibly high right now. To that point, we would say, if you, it, like the higher you climb, like my opponents are trying to advocate for, the harder you fall. That's why the recessions, because of boom-bust cycle of market capitalism, is ultimately inevitable. They just make the shock much more worse when it eventually comes. Second of all, the universal basic income is ultimately constant. It's a, it's a consistent con uh, injection of money into the pockets of Americans every single month. That constant means that it's not actually functioning as an automatic stabilizer whatsoever. So when the recession does hit, it doesn't actually stimulate the economy anymore. That's why we would say you can immediately prefer our argument about automatic stabilizers. Then even more so, three DAs. First of all, inequality. Alexander of the University of Melbourne finds that for each $100 increase in overall economic growth, only 60 cents goes towards alleviating poverty. Subsequently, Riley explains that growth empirically worsens income inequality and widens the gap between the rich and the poor. The reason why this always is on time frame because this is only sustainable past for so long. The New York Times explains that income inequality is just uh, just benefits the people at the top, and these people uh, gain money and hold on to the money, reducing consumption and slowing down the whole economy. Thus, Letterman of the World Bank finds that a 1% increase in inequality leads to a long-term reduction in economic growth by 6%. In addition, Landy 11 empirically finds that a 10% decline in economic inequality, income inequality would, uh, would grow the American economy by 50%. That's why we uh, that's why their side only exacerbates income inequality and decreases the growth in the long term. Second of all, warming. Economic growth will destroy the environment at the detriment of the poor. Riley explains that because growth leads to development of new things like hotels, retail malls, and industrial estate, it also erodes resources, overpopulating lands, and pressures scarce resources, speeding up global warming. That's why World Watch confirms that when consumption and economic output increased in 2010 and 2011, greenhouse gas emissions increased by 6%. This is why it's always their arguments on two fronts. First of all, it's on severity. Their impacts are contained only towards specifically people who are connected to the global economy. However, we affect everybody who's even disconnected from the world. This is how we outweigh on scope and impact the entire world, not just the 900 million that they talk about. Second of all, uh, second of all, this is on time frame because Kirk 18 finds that while growth seems appealing in the short term, in the medium and long term, it's hurting social, uh, social and civil cohesion. Further, action to reduce climate impacts must be taken immediately as we are running out of time. Sacrificing the environment for the economy is not just short term because it's not active, meaning uh, hastening extinction. Even more so, if they try to say climate change is not unique, it's ultimately a linear impact because we have to provide developing countries a means to adapt and ultimately insulate their economies before it actually hurts them. Then, even more so, third DA, overheating. Overheating occurs when the demand for goods outpaces the capacity to produce new goods, thus spiking prices. Luckily, means test of welfare limits the demands for goods because when the economy thrives, welfare spending falls as need decreases. That's why Carbuck writes in his books, Contemporary Economics, that as the economy grows, the number of people who qualify for welfare shrinks. This ensures the demand for consumer goods grows slowly, thus limiting the upward price, uh, upward, up, upward pressure on prices. However, their argument is literally linked into more and like too much economic growth, and that's what, what that's why Investor PD finds that this this inflation will eventually hinder the economic growth and be a precursor to a re recession. In fact, we outweigh probability here as LeBlanc 19 finds that five out of the eight last recessions were preceded by an overheated economy. If we want to best protect the American interests and preserve the economy, we must first look at the negative side.
at the top of our case, it's going to be winning, two part winning argument, then front lining, then back to their case. And that's that speak up, by the way? Yes, yeah. sorry. Okay. Two part winning overview on top of their case. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Two part overview on top of our case, front lining our case, and then responding to theirs. Is everyone ready? All right. Time starts. Now, we're going to say that preventing a recession is the most important impact for two reasons. One, it's the biggest impact on scope and magnitude. We both impact recessions. It's bigger than any of their first and second contention. But second, recognize their arguments are all about post-recession mitigation. But we would say preventing a recession is the most important impact because all their arguments about automatic stabilizers only mitigate the impacts inside the U.S. But if a recession goes global, there's hundreds of millions of people in other countries across the globe who don't have access to that mitigation. So if you prevent a recession, we win the round. Let's go to their first argument. They say that consumption poverty is stable. That might be true. The official rate might be stable. But 10 07 of the ACRH finds there are 50 million people hovering right above the poverty line who face the exact same negative benefits of poverty. So even though they're living them slight above the poverty line, they're staying above the poverty line, there's no meaningful reduction. Go to our second contention. Their first response tells you consumer spending is at an all time high. So the higher, higher you go, the harder you fall. They just spam a bunch of buzzwords here, but they drop their brown with brown 19 finds. Is that if you, the US economy can handle $2 trillion worth of spending, we're not at the highest point right now. We can handle that safely. But then they say there's an inevitable recession. There is no warrant as to why there's an inevitable recession. They say, boom bust cycle. That's not a warrant. Our brown evidence says as long as growth is high, small economic shocks will not push us into a full-blown recession. But even if there is a recession in the long run, we say we prevent all the intermediate recessions in the meanwhile, which means we have access to in, like a bunch of other recessions between now and the inevitable one. Then they read a bunch of DAs. Their first DA is inequality that says overall inequality goes up. But they don't read a warrant that's specific to the UBI. We would say on under UBI, uh, inequality go down for two reasons. One, the UN17 finds if the UBI actually gives the average worker more bargaining power, which are the CRGC finds, a UBI would decrease inequality inequality by 0.14 points. It's the only quantified impact on inequality, which means the access all their way. But second, none of their arguments are specific to a world where you give $1,000 to the lower and middle class. Obviously, a UBI would be way better. Then they say that growth stops, that growth is really bad because of warming. But the IMF finds every 1% increase in economic growth leads to a 4% increase in renewable investment. And we would say if you want to solve growth, the only way to do that is with renewables. But second, course also finds every 1% increase in growth leads to a 1% decrease in emissions because the average citizen now has more political capture and able to, to like um, justify their politicians to pass better policies. Then they say that overheating occurs when capacity is too high. Once again, cost by the brown evidence says we still have $2 trillion worth of spending every single year, and overall the top one-third of the UBI recipients will not actually spend, so we'll never see any overheating. Then they say that there's, that, that there's going to be inflation happening, but Zeza finds is A, there's no bright line. The maximum inflation under UBI, Zeza says, would be half a percentage point, which is not enough to trigger any of their disadvantages. But second, our Zeza, Zeza evidence says even with inflation, we see overall growth by 12%, so there's no argument on overheating. Go to their case. At the top about Section 8 housing, two responses. One, call some 15 of the NVER finds is that this problem exists in the status quo because landlords know that there's rent limits and voucher programs and artificially raise the rent to meet the tenant's new ability to pay. And second, Scali 18 finds only one in every five eligible voters also uh, actually receive this program, also cost by the weighing. This argument doesn't matter. Go to second mention about four and eight. At the top, you're turning it because it causes dependency in the long run. That's what Dabransky 11 of Cleveland State University finds is that aid empirically creates cyclical dependency where countries always rely on external aid and have no incentive to develop their internal economy. That's why after looking at a 50 year spread, aid actually reduces long-term growth. But we would say if we win growth, we win long-term upward mobility for these countries. That's Aurora. Their own Aurora evidence says every 1% increase in growth leads to 0.8% increase in the developing world. We say we have the best and cleanest access to, in, to, to growth. That's also important because their impact card says the reason why aid leads to lifting 10 million out of poverty is growth. The best internal link to solving poverty is growth. Go to their argument about recession recovery. The comparative analysis applies here. Our Holtz evidence says we solve for recession, whereas theirs is all mitigatory. On the A argument of recession recovery, recognize that recession recovery is non-unique to both worlds. Schneider 18 of the Brooklyn Institute finds is that progressive taxation and unemployment insurance are 75% of all automatic stabilizers. They don't go away. But Lawler also finds that they don't even, the, the automatic stabilizers are no longer automatic because they give them all out in block grants, which means states decide everything. There's no automatic nature. But second on debt disaster, what Tully 18 finds is the U.S. has the capacity to infinitely borrow because we always have private investors willing to buy our bonds. But second, what more 18 finds is even a 1.5% increase in growth decreases the debt by $3.44 trillion over the next 10 years. But then third, on their argument of, about um, emerging markets, Markets. They just copy paste all their evidence from the debt topic of last year. But Rosneck 18 finds is that the majority of investors are looking for a diversified portfolio of both risky investments and non risky investments. So they're never just going to dump all their emerging markets to go to the US because they're there for a reason and they want risk in that area. Yeah. Can we see the brand method? Yeah. Uh, can I see 75%? Too? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
says three quarters. It's got seven quarters. Um, year does Brown reference for the economy? Like, oh, what year is it? Well, yeah. it looks at 2017, but it also sure. says it's in written in 2019. So. Yeah, but it's referencing 2017. Well, right? no, but so, have we experienced growth wait, wait, since 2017? But there's two parts to it. One, it says in 2017, we saw these levels of under capacity. Sure. It says the economy is still running under 10% of capacity. Wait, it does? Every year without creating price. Wait, yeah, but that's 2017. Wait, no, it's written in 2019. Yeah, but he's so obviously really says in 2017. Okay, so 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 what percent of demand are we fulfilled right now? Okay, so well, I'm, just, I'm my argument is that we've experienced bad economic growth ever since 2017, okay, right? That's not so my argument. With tax cuts, etc. That's not my question. So we would say that my question is to what to what extent? If you say 2017 is too old, sure. in 2020, to what extent have we satisfied our capacity for demand? Because Noah's probably gonna Google it, and it's probably still gonna be under 10. percent So I mean. But I would say okay, that, so that just pushes the overheat target. Okay, it doesn't matter, right? right? It says in 2017 where we were, we could do two trillion. Even sure. if we do 1.9 trillion now, that's still way less than our plan. Like our, than our is case that like two trillion annually, or like yeah, two trillion dollars every year without creating price inflation. Okay, okay. I have a question. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, all your uniqueness evidence on emerging markets is from 2016, correct? Uh, emerging market stuff. Yeah, all the uniqueness as to why it's going to cause debt disasters in 2016, right? I mean, maybe I can check again. Did we see more. any debt collapses that you're talking about? About. Uh, it's been four years since I mean, like, there have been, like, there's been a scalar shift towards so how, investing in American okay. bonds. How scalar and what countries? I mean, like, the, like, do you want to Because like, all, the, the, the card you're talking about, the majority of those countries, the investors just stayed there after a small decline. After a small decline? I mean, like, yeah. our evidence is pretty explicit in, like, doing the empirical analysis well, of... Empirics from four up. years ago don't really matter as far as nothing actually materialized. Which, like, they have shifted over, right? Okay. I mean, it would be good if you read a piece of evidence after 2016 that indicated that there was some impact that your card was predicting for that actually materialized. I mean, like, historically, like, we have seen this okay, before, what right? countries? Like, like, what countries between 2016 and 2020 defaulted as a result of this problem? No, none of them defaulted, but we're saying that there have been shifts over, and we're saying okay. that trying to finance the UBI through debt and so, hiking up interest okay. rates is going to make So I guess I'll rephrase the question. To what extent does debt have to increase for you to access debt default, or any impact of your read? Debt default? Like, yeah. overall, like, it doesn't even have to be Default is just like, like one, it doesn't make sense, one right? form of a thing that gives like, gives the offense, right? We're saying that when there's less investment in these countries in the developing world, that means there's less like, insulation and less economic like, growth. This argument makes like no sense. Like Trump has increased the deficit by 50%. Sure. Every year we spend a trillion dollars in the deficit. Sure. We've never seen any of your impacts happen. Like I don't understand how much more, how much higher it has to get before we I see mean, like impacts. Argentina, Turkey, like they're all but seeing less those, economic stability. How much less effect, and right? none of them defaulted. So I don't see where you get the terminal impact. I mean, like our, our evidence indicates an 81% Increase in debt, right? That's but probably enough. Your impact right? evidence is specific to the probability of crises increasing debt by 88%. Sure. But none of those crises happen based I mean, on we are, We're seeing the initial indicators. Okay. Of I guess we'll see that. Can we see the initial indicators? Oh, okay. uh, I mean, uh, before summary, can I see the stuff you read against our environmental percent? <laughs> Yeah. 
We're gonna run fast. the car with the same warrant, but we can get rid of it if you want to. Yeah. But I don't think you can stop it. You don't have it? Okay. Right. Can we just scratch it then? Yeah. yeah. Just do the second one. The 4%. Four percent. The 4% four percent removal. The removal is the easy part. Okay. Um, the emission suit. Let me show you the other car for the emission reduction. The removal of the emission suit. Sorry. So the 1% yeah, yeah. to 4% goes away, the 1% to 1.7% this time. Yeah, so we're keeping the policy name. Yeah. yeah. So what what's happening to the striking? We're striking? The, There's the a second, well, I'll just tell you, it's the, the first. First response to the warming DA. The four percent removal. First response to what? The warming DA. Okay. They're responsible about like econ growth, increasing yeah, renewable. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're on all of the Is everyone ready? <clears throat> it's going to start on their case. Actually, where'd my flow go? I don't know. I have nothing to draw on it. Well, I think we should speak up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so, did you hear me? Sorry? Did you hear everything? <laughs> did you hear everything? I did. I did. I got up there a minute. Yeah, yeah. I'm an old man. Is 
everyone ready? Okay, it's going to start on the weighing that they give. Um, consumption party stuff, their seats, the dissets on the parties. Okay. Start on their weighing argument. They are they're just trying to tell you that you can prevent a recession. This ad, like argument is, is absolutely like ludicrous. We would say that like this is because of the boom bust cycle. There's the higher you grow, the higher you fall. There's no reason why they can ever prevent a recession by outspending. We specifically say that even if you prevent a U.S. recession, there's a, like vast other like other if other countries go into recession, like the U.S. would fall into recession as well. There's no reason why preventing a specifically like, U.S. recession will prevent all future recessions in the future world. But then on consumption poverty, a couple like one big response. They say like people are still going in and out of poverty because of like welfare spending. We would say if you use consumption poverty, the poverty level actually stays like stays level at three percent. That's empirically that's thermal defense to their case. But then let's go on the contingent uh, on their contingent about uh, consumption. Start on the dissent about inequality. The Alexander evidence never goes responding that tells you every one one hundred dollar increase in the overall economic growth uh, only sixty percent goes to alleviating poverty. They simply tell you that it's different under a UEVI. In so far as their internal war is that like economic growth solves for consumption and solves for uh, recession. We would say that economic growth is still bad in the long term. We are waiting for a couple of reasons. They don't respond to the time frame waiting, which tells you that. The only system, this is an unsustainable past. And so far as you keep on growing and increasing inequality, that's really bad because the later minute evidence concludes that a one percent increase in inequality leads to long-term reduction in economic growth by six percent. They're starting, they're creating the very problem that they're trying to solve. And empirically, the landing evidence this and go respond again tells you that a ten percent decline in income inequality would grow the American economy by fifty percent. That empirically shows that when you have a universal basic income, the economic growth only creates more income income quality. What that means for the ask is that they cause the very recession that they're trying to solve. But then on the environmental disad. The Riley evidence tells you that consumption is empirically bad because when you increase consumption, you increase the amount of glo global warming that happens. The only evidence that they extend is this, actually, they extend two pieces of evidence. They just first extend this 1%, like 1% like economic growth leads to 1% like decrease in emissions. This evidence is like really, really bad. It says increase in like trade. We would, we're arguing, they're like, their very own argument is consumption domestically. I don't see why it's like income and trade necessarily trades off of growth. But then their second argument is like policymaking is going to solve back. Look to 20, like 2011, the evidence still says that even if we had Econo high economic growth in 2011, we still saw global warming increase by 6%. That's empirically bad. We would say that we are here for a couple reasons. The first is on severity. The CMNC evidence who never goes respond and tells you that Americans, are like everybody, if everybody, not just those connected to the global economy, is affected by climate change. So this is why you should prefer climate change in the long run, but then go to our case. We're going for a second argument about automatic stabilizers. We tell you specifically that the, uh, the, <coughs> We tell you specifically that Mart evidence tells you that there's 75 percent of the chance of a recession in the next world. The IMF tells you that 900 million people are going to uh, go into poverty if the next recession. However, what Ruben tells you is that like welfare programs act as automatic savers. The only re as response that we get is that 75 percent of like uh, automatic savers was actually tax revenue. First, this makes zero sense. Tax revenues would not auto uh, stabilize the economy. Second, we would say this specifically. Welfare programs are specifically a lot better because they benefit the lower class. The lower class and the middle class is specifically what benefits the long term and the long uh, the economy in the long term. That's why empirically. We find the bad ones that finds that automatic stabilizers such as uh, means of welfare prevent an additional 18% decline in GDP. We would say this outweighs their argument because you can't always prevent a recession, but you can lessen the impact of a recession in the long term.
Um, orders top of my case wherever you flood the wing, then my C2, then the stabilizer by you. Is that loud enough? All right. <laughs> On the overview, they can see that preventing recession is the most and biggest important impact in the round. That means we outweigh all their, all their offense on scope. But second, they can see that mitigation does not matter insofar as 900 million people go into poverty in the developing world. That is cyclical and always a magic because people don't have access to well formed safetyness. This is really important because all their offense is only generated off of mitigation inside of the United States of the US automatic stabilizers inside the United States. As far as they can see, those US automatic, or automatic stabilizers should not apply to the developing world. We're always going to be ahead on the long term debate because those, those people that push into poverty in the developing world and trigger a long term irreversible impact, they can also resolve from. At that point, it's pretty clear that economic that, that recession solvency comes first. But second, they tell you it's ludicrous and they ha have boom and bust cycles. Remember, boom and bust cycles is not a war, which is why recession is always inevitable. But for the economic it simply says that high economic growth will always allow us to outpace recessions, but more importantly, allows us to insulate ourselves from other economic shots internationally. Their only argument is that other international uh, actors might cause a recession which triggers a U.S. recession in the future. We say from Aiken specifically that that type of the US, high U.S. growth prevents us from those types of recessions. At that point, they don't have access to U.S. welfare mitigation, prefer you know, prevention, recession prevention first. Sorry, go to my second contention about economic growth. They extend two terms. That's it. The first term tells you that a hundred, that one hundred dollars increase in growth leads to sixty percent increase in um, income inequality. Uh, sorry, a sixty percent increase in decrease in poverty spending. That is, doesn't really matter. As far as the UN evidence tells you that UBI specifically gives workers more bargaining power to bargain their employers to get higher wages, and the CRJC quantifies the impact, saying that overall a UBI would decrease inequality by zero point four one GDP points. This is really important because it's the most direct measure of inequality. They're just telling you welfare spending goes down in our world. That does not matter. As far as we solve the link of inequality directly, always refer our because it's far more specific. The second term they extend is this. Global warming term. There's absolutely no implication or trivialization of the impact whatsoever. You don't know how many people die. You don't know how many people go to poverty. It's not looking to the recession overview at all. But second, the cost is pretty specific. So you have 1% increase in economic growth through American consumption, which then triggers to trade, increases political tax rate to overall decrease emissions globally at 1.17%. Again, this is a much clearer link to the overall emissions impact. We want, we're ahead on warming. At that point, it's in the argument. They dropped the math that tells you that UBI would probably add $2.5 trillion of economic spe spending into the economy, which just quantifies would increase overall growth by 12.56% for far too solvency mechanisms. The first of Naren is completely dropped, which tells you the single best way to solve a recession is through private investment. Private investor investment increases when consumer spending is high because their confidence. Also, this is mitigatory because during times of recession, higher investor confidence is high, they reinvest. B. Aiken, high economic growth prevents any shocks from precipitating to a recession, where had the impact is 900 million people in poverty. Go to, that, go to their stabilizers argument. They really must understand it. It's not about tax revenue, it's about unemployment insurance and progressive taxation brackets. This is really important because you can that 75% of automatic stabilizers are not means tested. This is severely against the scope of the entire impact insofar it's terminally not unique. The ass solves are all the problems better than they do. But second, they can see that automatic stabilizers only happen in the US. It's a 900 million people global impact. They don't affect it. They say we can't prevent a recession in the future. It's supposed they drop the narrative tells you private investors are uniquely cute to getting out of a recession. That's what all of our welfare programs aim to do in the first place. We're always ahead there. But again, 900 million people go to poverty for the long term and cyclical little irreversible. Also, you vote on preventing that from happening. We can always intervene in the future. Do you extend consumption in your uh, summary? Yeah. It says not to use 2.5 trillion dollars, which is 2.7. No, 2.5. Okay, so no. you're saying that 2.5 trillion dollars into the economy necessarily goes consumption? Wait, wait, so, 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 wait, wait. 2.5 trillion dollars of consumption over eight years. That's massive. He says just like $1,000 to everyone. You spend those $1,000, that'll be $2 trillion. Wait, Matthew says that 2.5 trillion dollars will go be spent over eight years? Yeah, that's what he says. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, that gets divided up and then split up into like, do you want me to do like some debater, debater math? No, no, because so our authors do the debater math for you and find the point one four reduction in Gini coefficient. Yeah, okay, the Gini coefficient evidence is great, but it never accounts for the replacement of mean sets of well for two yeah, of the UBI. It does, it says it, it, the implementation of the UBI in the UBI. Yeah, yeah, but at the expense of mean sets of well, right? Realistic comparatives always meaning they just don't respond to it in the summer. Oh yeah, which is already talking Isaac accepts the Alexander evidence, that's the thing. You have a question? You can ask him. What? Question? Now we go. Sure. Um, no, let's talk about auto stabilizers. Why is tax revenue a form of auto stabilizers? Your card says tax revenue. Yeah, no, 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 it says the bulk of value of automatic stabilizers comes from the change in tax revenue, which identifies as shifting progressive taxation during the time of recession. Yeah, and then it's later like on, in the, later on like a couple sentences later, it literally says that the like uh, welfare system functions as like half of the yeah, fiscal yeah. stabilization the of the entire economy. economy. It's, it's it, says, it says these revenues accounted for three quarters on average of the effect of automatic stabilization. Also, like, the unemployment insurance is the second. Also, also like yeah. regardless of if it's taxes, that's still a thing that is not mean tested welfare that is causing automatic stabilization. So it's still not unique to your author. Not, no, it doesn't because yeah, you can prevent not the recession from getting worse. That's like yeah. definitive. Wait, you, you just says this part. This progressive taxation means tested. What? This what? progressive taxation a form of mean tested welfare. I don't think so. Okay, so then it's not. So then it exists in both worlds, and it does seventy-five percent of the Wait, work. Wait, no, that doesn't make any way. sense. If you remove half of stabilization, that's bad. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 that's literally what your evidence no, says. Bro. Says, it says says fiscal stabilization. Seventy-five percent of automatic stabilization. You mitigate your impact. All right, we're going to use this. Yeah. It, no, it says auto stabilizers are half of fiscal. Oh, we over here. Sorry. Okay. Order. Let's start on their second contention about economic growth. Realize the route is over when they concede the Alexander evidence, which finds that $100 of economic growth, 60 cents of it only goes towards benefiting the poor. What that means, and he also concludes that it's the rich and the upper class that ultimately save their income. And so when you redistribute money upwards, that means that the poor who actually, the people who need to spend the most to revitalize the economy never actually get to spend. What that means is it completely undercuts growth taking on their entire contention, but even more so on the warming DA. They really mishandle this. The only response we get is this policy making redirection, however, and they try to give imperial on it. However, recognize that even during times of high economic growth, we never actually saw that's why on net the 6% increase in emissions during 2010 and 2011, even during times of high economic growth, which means that the economic growth that they talk about only exacerbates climate change. What that means is that millions of people are going to be thrust into poverty as crop fields and infrastructure development is completely eradicated. What that means is that uh, for their case, we outweigh on scope. They just try to talk about people the, like linking into uh, the, the people who are connected to the global economy. But for those people who are relying on subsistence agriculture and are disconnected, those people are hurt the most and are disproportionately affected. That's why it's a very easy reason to vote for the affirmative there. Then uh, on the negative there, let's go to our case. On, econo on the, our contention about res recession recovery, the only response we get at the end of the day is this progressive taxation. But ultimately we say that we're able to prevent the recession from being much worth with, with the means test welfare system functioning as an automatic stabilizer. This is a ultimately just a mitigatory defense. They just try to frame it as the non-unique. It's completely not when it accounts for half of the economic recovery in the first place. That's why the Madowitz evidence at the bottom never really goes answered and finds that this automatic stabilizer prevented GDP from falling 18% 
percent more during to the 2008 Great Recession. They never actually interact with this argument, and it would have made it much worse for the recession in the first place. Even more, uh, even more so. That's why you make a couple extensions. The recession is impending by 2021. It will impact 900 million people. However, we're able to alleviate this and, and jumpstart recession recovery and prevent the recession from being much worse and much more like and much more severe and much more likely. And ultimately, their case is pretty much terminally not unique to the point where a recession is ultimately inevitable. You can't stave off a recession forever, and that's why we would say the higher you go, the harder you fall. And ultimately, if you want to bought off a magnitude, we must look towards actually solving back the recession in the first place because the boom bust cycle and ultimately means that you can't climb forever. For those reasons, we urge you to debate. So it's going to be Wang, RC2, then their C2. Is everyone ready? Or did you hear that? Okay. <laughs> All right. Time starts now. They have conceded in every speech that recession prevention is going to be the most important impact. Their only response and first final focus is that recessions are inevitable. Consistently, there is no warrant extended other than, quote, boom bust cycle. Our hearts evidence is highly specific in saying high rates of growth can avoid small economic shocks from pushing us into a full recession. That means that their, their, their only argument has no warrant. Our warrant the hearts evidence is very specific in saying if we have high growth, we will not go into recession. Then, extend the arguments how mitigation does not matter. This is conceded. All their stabilization arguments are about mitigation in the U.S., but we tell you that if 900 million people go into poverty in the developing world due to cyclical and generational poverty, all their offense about mitigation in the U.S. do nothing for the hundreds of millions of people in other countries. That is all dropped. If, they, if there's even a risk that we stop a recession, we access all these 900 million people. Let's go to the DAs they read. First, they read inequality. They drop our more specific UN evidence says a UBI specifically would give workers, workers the ability to bargain, and our CRGC evidence tells you we'd overall decrease inequality by 0.14 points. Prefer us because we're far more specific, A, on a UBI, and B, how much inequality would, would go down. But their second argument is about growth being bad. One, the course evidence is highly specific in saying a 1% increase in trade-related income, which comes via growth, would lead to a 1% decrease in emissions. But second, this DA has no impact extended in summary, and even if you call for the impact card, it's horrible. It's just very generic. This is no way this outweighs our case. Let's extend our argument. Our Matthews evidence says giving $1,000 to the low and middle class would create $2.5 trillion of spending, and Zeza finds that causes 12.6% of growth. That's important for two reasons that are both dropped. The first is the private investment solvency from Naren tells you the single best way to solve a recession is by private investment. That's also acts as their mitigation argument. But second, Oh, we, our Aiken evidence is dropped, sorry, our Hertz evidence is dropped that says high economic growth prevents shocks from causing recession. We are accessing recession prevention. Let's go to their case. There's a bunch of like 
drop defense. First of all, they say they prevent a recession from being worse. That's definitionally mitigation, so they don't get access there. But second, our Shiner evidence says 75% of automatic stabilizers are not means tested. It's taxation that exists in both worlds. There's a drop, non-unique, or mostly non-unique on their case, but even if you buy their case, stabilization happens too late, and the hundreds of millions of people in the developing world go into poverty. If you vote for us, you can actually have a risk of stopping a recession, which means you have access to all the weighing. The weighing is dropped, the non-unique is dropped, and the offense is dropped. Vote off.